Hello friends, welcome back to DIY Guitar Making. I've got not one parlor guitar, but two that I just recently built. If you guys have been following along, you've seen a lot of guitar number 86 and guitar number 87. And so what I'm gonna do in this video and the part two of this video that will come afterwards is I'm going to walk you through the full build process, including the design stages, the making of jigs, all of that stuff in this first episode, this first part of the full build of my parlor prototype. I am going to walk you through the rim set, the back plates, the top, the voicing, all of that, and culminating in closing up the sound box and doing the binding and purfling scheme. And then we will pick up with the rest of the instrument in part two. But uh, before we get started, before we jump back in time, let's just take a look at both of these guitars and really briefly, I'll strum them for you. number 87 All right. Let's get started. two parlor guitars. My parlor model is a brand new thing, so that's going to be super cool. So this is what at least I consider to be a starting point for designing a guitar. After this, I'll usually jump up here, add about a quarter inch or whatever you want for the width of your, your nut. Okay, so let's say add a quarter inch there, square that line across, then I can either design or trace from an existing template my headstock shape. I can also determine my inside string holes based off of the outside string holes. And then take a straight edge and draw those lines up towards the nut to determine where my tuner hole locations are going to be. Of course, you can have your tuner hole locations. They can be off to the side. I'm sure you guys have all seen this. It's kind of the classic design where the strings meet the nut and then splay outward towards the tuner holes. Or you can do a straight pull design, which is what I like to do, where the strings meet the nut and then continue riding straight towards their tuner holes. Okay, and in that case, it's very important to draw all this out to determine exactly where those tuner holes should go to meet those strings. Side note there, most people just put the tuner holes off to the side and have the strings splay out to meet wherever the tuner holes are. It's just easier design-wise. From there, you can draw your bridge, and then, again, this gets a little more complicated, but we can determine where the X brace is based off of where the wings of the bridge are. Uh, from that, we can determine where a sound hole it should be and where a transverse bar should be. And after that, I mean, you're pretty much there. You have a, you know, a couple other things to consider where your other braces, your finger braces, and your tone bars, where they come off of the X brace, and where your blocks are, right? You want to have a neck block here, and you're going to have a tail block back here. In a nutshell, that's your layout. What I'm working on right now is my fretboard template. When I make a new model, I like to make a dedicated template for the fretboard. I've already rough shaped this to the design I want. Of course, the taper is very important here. Uh, but when I say design, really, it's just the aesthetic detail at the end. 
And this is rough shaped, but it's not perfectly symmetrical. So what I've done at this point is I've drawn a center line here and looked at it closely and decided which side I liked better. Okay, and that is going to be this side right here. I just think it's a little more subtle than this curve over here. So what I'm going to do now is cut this fretboard template perfectly in half and I'm going to stick the good side that I like down to another piece of MDF with double stick tape and duplicate this shape that I like onto that other piece of MDF so that I can then glue that basically like I'm book matching uh, a set of backs or tops, right? I'm going to book match those two pieces that I made, which will give me the perfect symmetry on the fretboard tongue that I desire. I am still working on getting all the templates and various jigs and molds and fixtures ready for the parlor guitar model that I'm working on. I've got a exterior mold, an interior mold, which is for bending, and this is the shoe that goes with it. I just made a fretboard template yesterday and made a video about that. And I like to make a lot of just simple story stick templates like this. This is for setting up the sides for bending and aligning the waist uh, so you know exactly where to place it in the side bending machines that I have over there. Okay. And I actually made two of these because I want to be able to make two of these parlor guitars at the same time. And I made four of these so I can bend four sides all at once without having to wait for the side to cool and remove it from the machine. I have my bracing pattern for the parlor guitar and I'm going to make a template for that out of acrylic so that I can easily mark out my bracing pattern onto a top super fast. First I'm going to stick down the plans that I've created to my light box. You don't really need the light box for this, you could just stick it to your workbench, but since I have the light box it helps a little bit to see things. Then I'm going to attach a second piece of tracing paper over top, stick that down with tape, and I'm going to trace out, duplicate the pattern from my original example onto a new piece of tracing paper, simply because I don't want to have to cannibalize my original pattern in order to create the template. Next, I cut out the tracing with a razor blade, a little bit oversized, and then I use that oversized sheet to just roughly mark out about the size of acrylic that I want to cut. Hey, it worked. What do you know? All right, now we're gonna stick this down onto the acrylic. Center punch, mallet. I'm gonna go ahead with these two tools and mark out all the intersection points and points of interest on the bracing pattern so that I can then drill out those positions with little tiny holes on the drill press. And that will give me a place to mark onto my soundboard uh, every time I'm building one of these guitars, okay? Once I have all those marks, it'll be like a connect the dots pattern. I will then, once I have them marked out on the top, I can then just connect those little dots with a straight edge to get my full bracing pattern transferred onto wood. goes right here just like that however this material is very thin it's only a sixteenth of an inch it looks like about so this doesn't stick well in the acrylic like that so I'm gonna go ahead and just with super glue stick down this mahogany block right here and then 
using the existing hole as a reference, just drill that right through the block so that we have something substantial for the pin to rest in. All right, so lastly, I'm just gonna cut off the excess here on the bandsaw. That's all I got for you guys today. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Peace. All right, so I got some Western Red Cedar. I'm gonna be using these on the parlor guitars. Honestly, and I've talked about this before, but I just always look for the best wood quality-wise that I can find, regardless of the species. Of course, that it, that's within a narrow subset of species that is considered to be good for luthery. So, you know, I'm not gonna use ebony or balsa wood or something uh, out in left field. But within, uh, for me at least, Western Red Cedar, Sitka Spruce, Engelman Spruce, within sort of that category, I'm just looking for something with a really good tap tone. Uh, in some cases, I'm looking for very straight grain, but you know what? I say in some cases, because this stuff is fairly uh, wavy, the grain, it moves around quite a bit, and that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as it's not extreme and I just couldn't get over with these ones I could not get over how good the tap tone was it was absurd the more I tap on Sitka spruce the more if I'm being honest the more I just don't like it actually and uh, it keep I keep getting pulled towards Western Red Cedar uh, I can't tell if I like Western Red Cedar or Redwood more, but those two woods just seem to, in my limited experience, repeatedly blow my mind. All right, jumping over here, I have a set of Wenge right here, which is new to me. I've never used Wenge. Wenge, Wenge, I'm not sure actually which is more correct to say, but I'll, I like saying Wenge just because it sounds fun. So. We have a nice set of Wenge here. Wenge really has a stellar reputation tonally. Again, I haven't used it, but it has a really good reputation. I got this massive piece of Wenge here just to cut up into the fretboard and the bridge for this guitar. And then I'm just gonna have a lot of extra Wenge because I think I'm gonna like it. This was actually pretty inexpensive, this giant piece, very straight grained. Um, was $40. And I can get a lot out of this if I do plan on using Wangi for fretboards and bridges, which is another consideration of mine, something I'm an avenue I think I'm thinking about going down. Now this other set that I have here for the other parlor guitar is just boring old East Indian rosewood. It's not really boring. Uh, I, I like to call it boring just because I use East Indian rosewood a whole lot. So Honestly, it gets a little boring to me. <laughs> Adding a back stripe, just a decorative aesthetic element that is going to tie into the binding scheme and the end wedge later on. Uh, I've already got it here on the Rosewood Parlor guitar that I'm making. This is number 87. For the other guitar, number 86 will be out of beautiful Wangi and I'm going to put a similar stripe right now. Here's the material actually, into this guitar. And so the way that this works is I just incorporate that binding purfling sandwich that I have right there. I incorporate that into the jointing and joining process of the two plates, okay? So let's, uh, let's go ahead and just get started. Okay, so I have my light box here, and these two plates are very oversized. They're really for, I could make a dreadnought out of this if I wanted to, but I'm gonna be making a much smaller instrument. So it behooves me before the jointing process to simply cut this down a little bit in order to reduce the length of joint that I'm working on makes it easier 
and potentially makes it a little bit more accurate. And that looks like a good area to cover. Trace that out. Now that that's cut down, I'm gonna go ahead and save these two little scrap pieces here because these will work great if I choose to make a radial rosette, a radial solid wood rosette, which I think I might for this one. We'll see. All right, so let's take this to the shooting board, which I have right here. Let me grab my number five jack plane. I can load this up in my shooting board using the plane just to keep both of those pieces flush with one another as I clamp this down. I don't need to use this clamp here. In fact, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I just hold it with my hand, but uh, I don't know, sometimes I do like to use it. So if you have a shooting board at home that doesn't have the toggle clamp, that's fine too. It's just a, a preference thing. You might want to consider it just to try it out though. Okay, I'm gonna do enough passes to clean this up. I'm being extra careful here on the Wangi, by the way, because this stuff is notorious for giving you very nasty and large and deep splinters. So as I'm feeling this, I don't want to catch a splinter in my finger, which I've already done. All right. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at this. I have a feeling it's going to need a little bit of touching up. Okay, oh, that's actually, it only needs a little bit of touching up, less than I thought. That's pretty good. Alright, so by touching up, what I am referring to is just taking a flat beam with sandpaper. Sandpaper on a flat beam like this, just 220 grit, is a good way of truly fine tuning this. At least for me, I find that a hand plane uh, gets me 95% of the way there. And then I just need a couple swipes with this to truly finish it up. And that largely has to do with the inconsistent way that the grain enters this joint. Sometimes it's running out on the joint. Sometimes it's dead straight. Ideally, it's dead straight, but it wanders. And that wandering means that the plane approaches it in different ways depending on how that grain is oriented in that area. And that's how you end up with a not perfect joint on the plane. Also, to some extent, if your plane's not perfectly set up or the sole isn't flat, uh, that just adds to the problem as well. So take this beam here. This is actually um, the, what Stumax sells as a fretboard leveling beam works great for this and many, many other things where you just need a dead flat beam, which within the world of luthery and even woodworking, when do you not need a dead flat beam? It's very, very useful to have. So yeah, I would definitely recommend getting one of these or just finding some supplier that, you know, makes uh, straight edges and things like that. And um, I'm sure theirs will be just as good. All right, so line that up. Same thing, I'm using this just like it was the jack plane. I'm just truing up the two pieces before I clamp that down. I always like to check it to see if it feels flush, and it does. And so far I'm not getting splinters when I'm checking it. And I'm gonna take this and just shoot like that. Now, because when I'm going back and forth like this, I'm actually technically sanding twice in the middle and I'm more in the middle and less 
on the two ends. So, what you'll see me do is sand this till I think it's good, and then just come to one of the ends and just add a little bit more. Um, I could go to both ends and add a little bit more, but it actually doesn't matter too much if I just stay on one end or the other, or if I hit both of them. The point is, if I don't do that and I go and check it, there's a very good, very often I see a very slight gap of daylight in the middle. And so I just need to hit one of those ends to reduce that daylight. And that's how you do it right there. All right, so let's check that out. I swear I'm gonna get a splinter. I almost got one right there. You always gotta make sure you don't have chunks of uh, wood or anything like that under here. Place that down. And that is absolutely perfect. And so the way that I know it's perfect is not only do I look at it like this, I can see no daylight, even if I pop my head from side to side like this, I still at no point see the daylight, okay? Um, the reason I pop my head from side to side, by the way, is just to see if I have some sort of parallax error, meaning I'm looking at it from the side. If I'm looking at it from the side, but there's a gap straight on, I'm not gonna see that gap. So if I kind of shift my head around a little bit, at some point I will just for a moment catch that flicker of light in the gap. So it makes it a little easier to find it. And another thing you can do is take the two pieces and do that. And you can feel the friction. You can even hear it. Okay. And you should feel that both in the middle and on the ends. Okay, so that's good. That's a perfect joint. Now I'm gonna take my sandwich here. So this is a piece of ebony binding before it gets bent, meaning it's just the same uh, ebony material that I use for my bent binding strips. Uh, in order to match with the binding, I take one straight strip bef that before it goes through the bending process, I pull one of these straight strips out and I glue these maple veneers onto the sides. Okay, and now this is going to end up getting glued in here along with this joint. Okay, just like that. Well, now let me cut this down to size. All right, I'm gonna go nip that on the bandsaw. I'll be right back. All right, so that's the appropriate size there. Okay, so now this piece just needs to be cleaned up a little bit. It's got some dried glue on it. This is a I haven't uh, adjusted the height of this piece or cleaned up the dried glue, so this needs a little bit of work in order for it to be a good mating piece between my two halves. Because essentially what I'm doing now is I'm making this work just like it would for a three-piece back. This strip right here is just like my middle piece for a three-piece back. That's how I'm treating it, okay? So I have to make sure that these edges are smooth and flat. Okay, so first I just want to reduce the overall height of this a little bit to make it fit in the joint uh, a little bit easier, right? So this will 
after it gets glued up, this is going to come down a lot just from planing and sanding and thicknessing the plate. But I can um, help that process out a little bit by knocking this down in the first place, which also will help me to avoid gluing this in and say having a, a part of the plate where the maple doesn't quite, you see how the maple can, comes shy of being flush with the top. I don't like that. I want to get this down so that it looks more like it does in the middle here where the maple meets the top all the way around. That way I can guarantee that when I thickness the plate I'm not going to have any spot on here where the maple is still sitting below the surface like it is right there. Alright, so let's trim this down just with a nice little thumb plane here and I can just hold it at the edge of the bench like that. And it's real pleasant to make these cool little black white Oreo colored shavings here. Okay. Well, one more hit. All right. Much better. Now to just clean up the sides so it has a good joint uh, in between the two book matched halves. I'm just going to use this sanding board right over here. And I want to be very minimal with this because those veneers are thin and I don't want to drastically thin them out or even sand through them. Just trying to clean up the glue and make sure everything's flat. So let's take a look at this joint now with the strip in between. It should be good as long as everything is flat on those maple veneer pieces and there isn't any leftover glue. Now I'm struggling to hold this because this one piece of wangi is warping a little bit on me which is okay. A little bit of warp you can just keep on rolling with. You don't even have to correct it. You can just glue it up. And uh, it's manageable, I guess is the word. Yep. That is going to be a perfectly tight and beautiful joint. All right, so let's put this little strip to the side. And now I have to align these plates together again and I'm going to use my beam just to kind of flush them up like that. Then I'm going to take two pieces of tape, flush them up like that, tape up the joint and we're doing this because I'm going to cut an angle into here which then when I fold it open, it's going to create a wedge shape, like a trapezoid. And that wedge shape is what we're going to use to create uh, a pressure system for gluing those two halves together. You'll see what I mean. So let's start by just taking a straight edge. I'm going to find a longer straight edge. Here we go. Here's my long straight edge. Take a straight edge or a ruler, and there's actually a lot of extra material on this, so there's a lot that I can cut off. So I'm going to trace an angled line and cut this on the bandsaw. And then this rough cut that I made, I can just true that up on the jointer real quick. Okay, so there's that wedge shape I was talking about, that trapezoid. 
and I can take this tape off. That was really just to hold the two pieces together while I made that cut. So this is the joining board. You can't really see it, but there's packaging tape all over here. You can see this packaging tape because it's a darker color, but there's some clear tape over here as well. And that just keeps me from gluing this to this, which we do not want. Let's not forget our friend, the back stripe here. So that just gets wedged in there like that. And then we have a fence, which will go right there. Pull this to the edge so that I can then clamp the fence in place. That's gonna be great. I've got these weights right here um, so that we can add the glue, place this down, put the weights on top, which keeps it from buckling upward, and then just take a little mallet and tap this into that wedge. And that's what creates our pressure. Pop this open like this and need some glue. It's helpful just for an extra set of hands to take a spring clamp and just place it like that keeps this thing from falling over and it holds the two pieces together while you run the glue. There's another uh, area here where I'm trying not to get splinters, wangi splinters, in my finger as I spread this. The surface is pretty smooth though, so I guess that means I'm at less risk of getting jabbed. Never have too much glue in this joint. It's okay to make a mess of glue here, especially since we have a third piece in this joint, which is our back stripe. So I do like to place that in there. And before I put the weight on and tap this in, I just kind of Move it around like that, and that's just my way of spreading some of that glue onto the back stripe piece by just pressing it in there and moving it around a little bit. Okay, so first with just some finger pressure, I'll push that in. And then the weight, random scrap block, mallet. I'll just take the scrap block, I'll adjust the camera because you can't see. Take the scrap block, place it right there between the two pieces, and just give it a little love tap. Maybe another one. There's no need to overdo that. Even a small amount of tapping puts a significant amount of pressure in there, which is good. That's what we want. Okay, so that's good to go. Once that comes out, I can cut it into this profile shape here and thickness it. And then I'm ready to start laying back braces on these. I already have the parlor sides bent. They are in the bender right now. I'm going to pull them out in just a minute and really get to work on building these parlor guitars. The two parlor guitars are now finally in the mold. I've got the blocks on there. Both of those blocks had to be contoured to a new radius, a special radius that I haven't used on my other models. There's no need to reinvent the wheel and have to create new jigs all the time. I have a bunch of radius blocks that are at various radii. And so I adapted my curves here the design that I originally drew wasn't exactly a 16 inch radius. It was probably 17 or 15 or something like that. And I just adjusted that uh, on my plans in, at the design stage just slightly to accommodate a 16 inch radius simply because I knew that I own a 16 inch radius block. That's just a little tip for you guys. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to build new uh, blocks and jigs like that every time you make a, a new design. So I've got the braces, the side braces in here, 
And what I'll be doing next is in installing the kerfing. I'll also be leveling all of the extra material that you see here. The parlor guitar saga continues here. I've got this back plate. I've got the braces all glued up and I'm gonna show you how I did that. So here's my template that I made for the back braces. Oh, and by the way, I should mention, cause it's kind of jumps out at you, but the one brace at the top, which is not slanted, is that way because it is simply there basically to support the neck block and help tie the neck block into the sides. So that just runs straight across and basically butts up against the neck, neck block or at least comes very close to it. But then the other braces are following that slant. Um, it's experimental. Don't try this at home <laughs> uh, unless you want to, but just don't. Okay, let's get into it. So I've got some strips here of Western Red Cedar and we are gonna make some braces out of this. These are six millimeter width, which is just a, a width, a standard dimension that I've been using for a long time now. Uh, the idea is tall and skinny is the way to go. It follows the cube rule, which uh, if you're familiar with Irvin Samaji and his teachings, if you set up a brace of the same exact volume, but most of that volume is put towards its height, it's going to be three times stronger than a brace of the same exact volume, but the volume is spread out widthwise like this, okay? That's the cube rule. Just remember, tall and skinny. So right now I'm just going to mark so I can cut these on the bandsaw. And then I could probably just use a scrap. Yeah, then this scrap piece will fit up there. So I just need these two. I'm going to go make a quick cut. So I'm going to sand these in the radius dish. Right off the get-go here, I like to just mark T for top on all the tops of these because after we sand these, it is very easy to mistakenly glue the flat side, the top side down after you put all that work into radiusing the bottom. And that's what we're doing, by the way. I'm radiusing the glue surface of these braces so that once they're glued to the back plate, the back plate is very, very thin, only about a hundred thousandths of an inch, and that back plate is going to be pulled into the radius that we want by the braces, and also by the rim set, which I have over here, which has also been radiused in this dish, okay? This is a 30-foot radius dish, but that doesn't matter too much. You can use a, a wide variety of radii for instrument making, and many people do. All right, so now on the bottom here, I can just mark this up with pencil. That way when I sand, I'll know when I'm there, when all the pencil disappears. And I'm just gonna take this whole cluster of three. Like I said before, doing back braces like this on a, such a small guitar is, re it's really nice as a change of pace for me um, just how simple it is. I just have three braces and I can hold them all together like this and sand them at the same time. Now, once this, once this basically gets there, I am going to sand them just a tad individually, just because pinching three together like this, there's a tendency, especially for the middle one to not quite sand all the way just because my finger pressure is really on the, the outside ones and not on this one that's sandwiched in the middle. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, they will need a little bit of individual attention just to be sure that that radius is true all the way across. Very important, I'm not pressing down when I'm doing this because softwoods like spruce or cedar are extremely flexible, right? That's part of the reason why we like them. So if I'm pressing down, then I'm actually pressing it into that radius. I'm essentially cheating 
and those pencil marks will go away very quickly if you press down, but you won't actually have the radius on there. This bottom surface will basically be flat. So I just want to gently graze across the radius dish surface. Looks like they're all there except for this one. And I bet you this one will go right away if we just isolate it away from these two. Almost. There we go. All right, so here's our back plate for guitar number 86. We've got our radius dish as the base here. We don't want to just glue this onto a flat board. We want the radius dish behind the braces. And now the first thing we're going to do is just dry fit these braces on here. You can't see it on the camera, but I already have marks on the rosewood of the back here uh, for the locations of my braces. And I transferred those from that template that you saw earlier. So check this out. I have a bunch of little scraps of mostly mahogany, but you know, any hardwood here, little square scraps with double stick tape on one side. And I'm going to use these to reference and hold my positions of the braces so that when I glue them, I don't have to worry whatsoever about them swimming when they're lubricated by the glue. So, I always call these spacer blocks. Put one right there, one on the other side. To box it in. So that's on this end of the brace, and then I'll do the same exact thing down on the opposite end of the brace. And essentially what I'm doing is boxing it in and creating a little channel for the brace to sit in. So it can't move. And then I can go ahead and glue that one in. It's real easy to overdo the glue here because it's a very thin surface. But like I always say, it's better to overdo the glue than it is to underdo it. All right, now this just goes right in that channel that we've created. And then starting from one end of the outline and working my way back, I'm going to put a go bar uh, about every three to four inches. So, and on we go. I'm going to do the next brace, same thing. I'm going to box it in with the spacer to give it a little channel. Glue it in with the go bars. And then clean up the squeeze out. And I have a nice big chunk of Wengi right over here. Look at this beautiful piece of wood. Um, you can be forgiven for not thinking it's beautiful. It's actually, Wengi is notoriously kind of bland, but I think it looks beautiful. One thing, one part of its beauty is how reliably straight grained or quarter sawn quarter sawn and straight grained Wengi is. You can really find good samples of it. It hasn't been totally plundered, let's say. And um, so right here you can see that I have some good quarter sawn bits over here. And I'm gonna use this giant board here to get a number of things for my guitar number 86 parlor guitar, which is the one that's going to be pretty much an all Wengi guitar. We're gonna have a Wengi bridge, Wengi fretboard, Wangi back and sides, which I already have right here. And we are going to have a Wangi head plate as well. So for the bridge, certainly I want this really nice quarter sawn bits over here. You can see it gets more rift sawn as it travels towards the, what would be the center of the log here, which is true for 
you know all uh, boards of wood you would have. So you're always going to have a quarter sawn area that even in the best case it's going to start to drift to rift sawn uh, pretty rapidly. So anyway I'm going to use this good section here certainly for the bridges. So the bridge comes from over here. I can get the fretboard from over here as well although I really could get away with more rift sawn or even flat sawn material for a fretboard but it is a bit more optimal and ideal to get it from the quarter sawn side. And then there's the head plate which honestly that's aesthetic. I can get that from anywhere on this board. Uh, over on the rift sawn side is totally fine. So I might try and get as many fretboards and bridges from this area as I can. The first thing I think I'm going to do though is just cut a big veneer off of here. Resaw it off as you would for cutting backs and sides. And I'm going to get my head plate from there. Then I'll have a lot of extra material. I could even use it for a whole nother back and side set on, a, on another guitar. But I really just need one head plate from that. And then we still have plenty of thickness to work with to cut out fretboards and bridges. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is just take this over to the jointer and clean up this surface and the other edge down here. One, to prepare it for resawing, I need a nice square edge so that I get a nice square cut. And then also just, I'm going to do that on both sides just so that I can have a fresh surface to mark out on, on this side. Let's uh, jump right into that. Let's head over to the jointer. All right, and now that this is squared up, this sits on a flat surface. This sits not perfectly, but reasonably square, and I'm fine with that. So that way, when I run it on the table of the bandsaw, it will, it should sit reasonably square there as well, which will give me a consistently thick plate that I'm trimming off of the end here. So the reason we're not going to just run this straight through against the fence without the resaw bar is because of something called drift. So if we did that, this blade, we're not, this isn't like a table saw blade, for example, where it's going to stay rigid no matter what. And if you kind of travel a little bit, if anything, a table saw blade is going to react violently and push the piece away, but it is not going to drift. It will hold its position. A bandsaw blade, however, is a whole different tool here, a whole different animal. And so this can and will actually flex and drift around uh, depending on basically how you're holding the wood and depending on the character of the wood itself, it's going to get sort of pushed and moved around, which we don't want. We want it, we want to stay nice and straight down that line that I scribed on there. So enter the resaw bar. The point of this is we are going to take this and instead of running it flat, let me just lock this down just to explain this. Instead of running this flat against the fence, we are going to run it against this bar right here, which allows me, so vertically the bar will keep things nice and square, but in this dimension right here, I can actually turn the board and correct for drift myself. And the way I'm gonna be doing that is by looking at the line that I scribed, right? So I'm just going to be, as I see the blade start to drift ever so slightly away from that line, I just turn the board and watch the blade as it comes back in towards the line. And then if it gets a little too close to the line, it looks like it's about to undercut it, I go the opposite direction. And I just keep doing little micro corrections like that all the way to the end of the board. All right, so let's go ahead and set up our fence here. Lock it down. Okay. 
So here we've got guitar number 87. I'll tilt this a little bit so you can see that cool bracing pattern. It looks pretty slick. Um, it does have a purpose too, but hey, I can admire the way it looks as well. And this one is rosewood. And guitar number 86 over here is at this point still identical to number 87, except for the fact that this one is Wengi. I'm at the point where the back is attached. I've made the neck blank here. I put the truss rod slot into it. We've got a heel block on the back, the scarf joint up front. So everything's laid out and this is ready to go uh, to have the, the joint, the mortise and tenon cut and the, uh, the, you know, ultimately to have this carved, the headstock shaped and everything like that. And then I've got my soundboard thickness and one thing I did recently was install this fiber strip inlay here with some really cool blue poplar fiber strip veneers. So basically what's in here is this stuff. And it was just a whim. I just kind of thought, hey, I want to build a guitar with a little pop of color in it. Usually everything's earth tones and maple and mahogany, etc. But it'd be cool to put something a little less natural looking honestly on a guitar just to make it stand out here i'll show you it sanded back actually on this guitar you can see it a little better because i've sanded that back but yeah it's gonna have a nice sort of like aqua blue color to it and there's going to be a purfling scheme to match with that so you will see plenty of white and blue on the soundboard side. Um, and then they'll just be ma maple purfling all along the sides and the end wedge and the back. And why don't we put a little mineral spirits on here just so you can see what this will actually look like under finish. You can always use mineral spirits or denatured alcohol or even naphtha or water. You don't use too much of it. You don't wanna swell things um, to mimic the look of finish. So that is what we're after. Pretty cool, right? So that's where I'm at right now. I'm ready to lay out the bracing to glue my bracing blanks down here and have them carved. And we'll proceed from there. So I have behind the camera here a variety of different size blanks, just oversized rectangles of western red cedar mostly. Some of it is Sitka spruce. Most of this is the cedar though. So the way that I do this is I just always keep a nice bin that I can cut up larger billets into dimensions that I commonly use. So these big pieces are 14 by 6 millimeters. And then I cut some smaller pieces that are uh, still six millimeters wide, but only eight millimeters tall. And lastly, transverse bar is 14 by 14. So now I can take these blanks and just line them up with my pattern. Make them a little bit oversized. You want a little bit of extra to work with. You see how this is extending just a little bit, about an eighth of an inch past the outline, same thing on this side, so that's where I'm going to cut it. By the way, for the X-Brace and for this single tone bar here, on the larger guitar there's two tone bars by the way. Um, for the X-Brace and the tone bars, I like to kind of sift through my bin of bracing blanks and look for the best most high quality pieces that I can find. So that would mean the most quarter sawn, meaning the grain is standing straight up as viewed from the end here. And also the tightest grain lines, basically within this six millimeter width, the largest number of grain lines I can get. Okay, so that's optimal. It's not that I wouldn't be okay with something. Uh, here's one like this, this actually isn't, isn't bad either, but you can see that they're a little bit wider, those grain lines, than this one. So this one's a little bit better than that one. 
All right, and then I think the leftover waste piece here, because again, I still really like the grain on this individual piece. This will probably work for my tone bar, and uh, now I just need to find blanks for everything else. All right, here's my transverse bar. In fact, I've already got the hole for access to the truss rod adjustment mechanism. That's already drilled in there, so that's nice. That'll work great for that. The transverse bar, by the way, sets the upper limit to the perimeter of our vibrational footprint. So everything below this bar is the vibrational footprint of the top. That's what's intended to be responsive. And everything above the bar, you can consider essentially acoustically inert. That's really more about having a good, strong structure for the neck block and the uh, fretboard tongue, which is gonna sit on top here. So now, lastly, I just need two. Normally there's four finger braces, two on each side, but for such a small model here, I'm only doing two finger braces and that fills in the space appropriately. Uh, this is the fretboard graft. So it's not a brace, it's a graft, meaning it's, it's like a piece of the top, you know, a thin flexible plate that gets glued to the top to add thickness to the top in this area. And then the bridge plate is a plate as well so it doesn't stand tall like a brace it is a thin plate of material in this case maple this is the bearing surface for the ball ends of the strings and it helps distribute out the torque from the bridge which is located directly on the other side of this plate so let's cut these down the length i could take this over to the bandsaw to do it or i could just do what I'm doing right here. And just use a little Dazuki saw to cut these out by hand. Okay. There we have it, looks pretty good. I think we're done. No, I'm just kidding. Let's go ahead and radius the bottom of these braces. So this top is going to have a 30 foot radius. That's gonna give it a outward dome to it, which gives the top a lot more structure than if it was just flat. Um, you, you never want to glue a top dead flat to your rim set because you're going to run into all kinds of problems when that wood moves because wood is hygroscopic and it's guaranteed to move. And not to mention you're going to have to brace it up a lot more than you otherwise would have to if it had just a little bit of doming to it. Because again, doming creates strength, creates structure in and of itself, even without the braces. Great example of that is just an egg. An egg you might think is very fragile, and it is if you actually hit it uh, on the edge of something, like the edge of a tabletop. But if you just take an egg and squeeze it, and you can go ahead and try this if you want, <laughs> uh, it's actually hard to break an egg that way because an egg is strong. That shell the shape of the shell is strong, even though the material of the shell is weak. So, we need to radius the mating surface of all these braces before we glue them down. Here we are about to cut the lap joint into our two arms of the X brace here. So the way that these go together is, well, a lap joint, which basically means we're going to have a notch on one piece and a corresponding notch on the other piece so that those two notches can bite into one another, forming a joint. So we'll start out by just laying this in place and before I do anything at the joint here, just for the sake of being able to very easily find the correct orientation and not confuse myself um, as I go through this process, I'm gonna go ahead and mark the orientation that it's in right now. So what I mean by that is I'm gonna write L, R, right down there for lower right, and 
LL for lower left. Okay, and that should be enough there, but I can also go up here and write UL, upper left, UR, upper right. So that way there's no way I can get confused here. So now let's line this up in its footprint. Hold that in place, and then I'm just gonna balance this other piece on top of the bottom piece. Line that up, there we go. And I'm doing this just so I can mark exactly where that joint is going to be, right there. All right, so now I'm gonna use a square in the marking gauge to completely mark out this box or this notch that I'm gonna cut. I'm gonna cut out the notch and then I can press those two together, mark out the next notch and cut that notch. At that point, I'll have two notches and there'll be a little bit of fine tuning after that, uh, but that's pretty much it in a nutshell. All right, so we've got a really nice, super tight joint here. And we're gonna go ahead and glue down the X brace first. And then as you'll see, all of the other braces are really a process of fitting those, uh, I like to think of them as like the capillaries coming off of the main artery. I am going to be carving and voicing this lovely parlor guitar top here. And ultimately my goal by the end of the day, I don't think this is all gonna make it on this video. Um, I'll stop recording at some point just so I can get things done real quick. But my goal is to get to this point right here. So I'm working these two parlor guitars at the same time. This one is a bit further ahead than this. And so I just need to catch this up. Sharpen your freaking chisels. I know a lot of you guys out there do sharpen your chisels very well, um, but this tip is really for beginners. A lot of people starting out don't even know what a sharp chisel is. One thing you can do is go to another woodworker, find a, a wood shop in your area, and honestly just pick up a sharp chisel and, and use uh, a chisel that somebody else has sharpened just to experience what sharp actually is. Speaking of sharpening, let's talk about honing now a little bit. Many of you guys might not even know, if you're, if you're beginners, that there's a difference between honing and sharpening. So as you use a chisel, what's happening is that very razor sharp, what's called a zero edge, the absolute point of the chisel, the metal is very, very thin there it actually reaches a, a point of zero at some point. And at that tip, what's happening as you're working the chisel, you're getting a little burr of metal that's curling off the end of that tip. That burr will make it seem like your chisel isn't as sharp as it was before. 
But the reason it's not cutting well is not because it's not as sharp as it was before, it's because of that burr. And all you have to do is remove the burr. You don't actually have to return to whatever your sharpening system is. And so that's where a leather strop comes into handy. So all this is, is a piece of leather that's fastened to a block. Now this is a commercial product that you can buy, but that I'm telling you just what it is. So you could even just find the materials. If you have a piece of leather and something to stick it to, you've got a leather strop. In addition to that, you need some compound. It's not hard to find. Look up uh, compounds that you would use for honing or for a leather strop, and you will find a product like this. I have literally only ever rubbed this compound onto the strop once, and I think that's all you ever need to do. Uh, perhaps maybe in 10 years or something, this compound will have worn off, but basically it gets worked into the leather and you never have to use it again. So as I carve, and here I'll just take a couple swipes off of this. Um, I wouldn't do it this frequently, but I might do it after every brace end. That's actually a pretty good flow to get into. Or otherwise, just when you feel like you need it, right? You're just going to keep this at your side. Again, convenience means you'll actually use it, so keep it nearby. And place the flat side of the chisel down and draw it back. And then flip it over and hold it a little bit more carefully this way. Because on the flat side, it's easy because you have a nice flat surface to reference and to keep it flat. Here, you have to actually balance it on the bevel. Now, this is more forgiving than if you had sloppy technique with sharpening. With uh, the leather strop, you don't have to be perfectly on that. It's, you're, you're not going to dull your edge if you, you happen to swivel off of that uh, just a little bit. But it's, it's best to try and keep it right on that bevel as you draw it straight back. Okay? And not to flick it back. That's not the idea. You're not curling. You're maintaining that bevel angle. Okay? So that's a strop. Uh, but here's a cool tip. I don't know if this is a tip within the tip or a whole new tip, but a ready-to-go strop that you always have with you. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to uh, add honing compound. You don't have to do anything is the meaty part of your thumb. So this does not work as well as the leather strop, so I still use this and recommend it. But sometimes in a pinch, if I just don't have that at my side, I will just take the back edge of the chisel and just go like that. And then take the other side and go like that, okay? I would say this works about 50% as well as the leather strop. I notice a difference. I notice that doing that has deburred the edge mostly. I can tell it's cutting better again when I do that. So again, meaty, this part of your thumb is, is a great area to use. And all that's doing is knocking those burrs off the edge to reclaim that zero edge. You will save yourself a lot of time and thus enjoy the process much more if you just take the time at the outset on the first guitar that you build Take the time to make yourself a story stick. So here's what a story stick is. A story stick has all of your measurements on one ruler, right? It tells the story of whatever project you're building, in this case, a bracing pattern. So when I make this, I always use, depending on how many, how complicated the bracing pattern is, I will use different colored uh, pens and markers so that the various different braces are easy to find and there's no confusion, right? Because you can see, here's the center of my X brace. So I line that up right there. And I can clearly see the two ends that I'm marking because they are both also in that gold color and they're also very clearly marked. Lower X, center X, upper X. You can see how if I use the same colored pencil, it would get confusing here because I have these other marks that are kind of in between these ones for the uh, transverse bar, okay? But those are in black, so it's not confusing. So to show you how this works, I would just take this, make my marks there, and then I would do that other brace. And then when I wanted the transverse bar, 
I would just come up, line that up on center, and there's my transverse bar, and on and on. In addition to the story stick, I also have a tiny piece of acrylic here that I've carefully thicknessed to the exact thickness that I like to use for the depth of all of the braces that get tucked into the structure of the sides. So your X brace arms and the transverse bar, those all get carved down to a predetermined depth. In my case here, that's 0.115 inches and they get tucked into the notches of the sides. So a part of my marking out process is just taking this little depth template here and just marking these out. All right, let's do some actual carving now. Uh, right off the bat, I just want to mention, you may have noticed that my chisel looks a little wonky here. That's because this is a two cherries guitar brace chisel. And uh, you can absolutely use a normal chisel for this type of work. But I just like these guitar brace chisels. That curve just makes the, the feel of the work a little bit, the flow of it a little bit easier. And so it actually goes a little bit quicker. Most of you guys are probably using the chisel sort of like this right here. And that's fine. That cuts really well. But you can improve the cut just a little bit by skewing the angle of the chisel. Not the angle in up and down like this, but skewing it like this and carving that way. Now the reason that cuts better is simply because if, if I'm coming straight on like this, then the wood is presented with the full angle of the bevel, which in order for the the metal to be strong enough so that it doesn't just fold over under the, the work and the pressure that we're subjecting it to. In order for that metal to be strong enough, it has to be a pretty steep angle. It can't be a very acute angle. So we're forcing a steep angle through the wood, which makes the cut a little bit harder. However, what we can do is if we turn the chisel like this, what happens is we actually change that angle. If you think about it this way, I always like to think of it as like a, I like to hike a lot, so it's a, a good hiking analogy, is it's very hard to hike straight up a steep hill if you've ever tried that. If you look at trails in, say, national parks, you will see that they're always switchbacks going up because it's much easier to attack the hill at an angle because the grade is less. And it's actually the same exact concept here. If I'm pushing this straight like that, then the wood is essentially going straight up that mountain. No switchbacks. If I turn it like this, the wood is moving at an angle, basically like a switchback up the bevel of the chisel. So, we haven't actually changed anything about physically about the chisel itself. So the material and the edge of the chisel is just as strong. It's not going to fold over or break, but we have effectively changed the angle. It's pretty cool. So yeah, all you have to do is skew the chisel just like that. You can use bevel side up or bevel side down. And I use both depending on what I'm doing at the moment. So you might see me switching from, from going flat side like I am over here. And then as I get to the point where I need to start scooping this out, I will go bevel side down.
That's good. This one is voiced. We're here in the shop. It's snowing outside. That's kind of cool, right? It's not that cool. You guys in Canada are probably like, screw you, man. You call that snow? Um, it's snow to me, though, here in Pennsylvania. We get a good good amount of snow too. The two first tasks that I have for these parlor guitars is I have to bend my binding strips and I have to drill some tuner holes, okay? So I got this neck blank all set up here. There's another neck blank right here. I got the locations of my tuner holes punched out and these are ready to be drilled. But hey, let's first talk about what I've got going on here with these binding strips. So these are ebony binding strips and I've used this jig here which is essentially like a skinny joining board like you would use for book matching tops and backs. Made these specifically for attaching the side purfling to my binding strips because these guitars on the bottom edge of the binding along the sides there will be a nice attractive little maple strip. And I've got some of the maple strips right here outside of the joining board just so you can see it. So this is what I'm talking about. So something like that, okay? And again, this functions like a joining board so that I can use this wedge, this wedge-shaped piece of wood in the middle to put pressure against the purfling strip in order to glue it. All right, so let's go ahead and take this out of the joining board. And now the first thing I got to do is just uh, trim some of the excess purfling that's kind of sticking up here. And I can use an adorable little arch top carving plane. This is the, the smallest one basically that they sell, which is a 25 millimeter. It's called an arch top carving plane. Some people call it a, a violin maker's plane. And I'm just going to use this to trim down the high spots. It's also getting some of the glue. And this is just to get it close to the ebony. Uh, I'm not gonna take it right down to it with this because I don't wanna bite into the ebony. Let's get a good fine grit, like 180. And I can just, now that I've got that strip close, I can just hold it here like this, put my finger on it, and just pull it through like that. And hopefully I don't get a splinter. Now an important part of bending these 
ebony binding strips is to organize them first, particularly because they have this purfling strip. It's very easy to bend all of these and end up with, say, half of your binding strips with the purfling on the wrong side, right? You'd kind of be in a bad place if you bent this and your purfling's up here on the top, right? You're, there's really no way to recover that piece. So it's as simple as this. On a guitar, you need half of your strips with the purfling facing one way and the other half with the purfling facing the other way. See that? Now I'm actually going to be doing two guitars at once. So I'm going to go ahead and double that here. So these two will face down and these two will face up. All right, so two down, two up. Two down, two up. And all of these go together. And what I'm going to do now is butt all the ends like that. And I like to make sure there's a tiny gap between each piece before I tape these together. I don't want them perfectly smooshed together. So that looks pretty good. So they're all pretty close together, but they're not all touching. The reason why I don't want them all touching is because when we go to bend these, if they're pressed right up against each other like this, there's always the chance that when you load it up into the bender, that one edge of that can actually ride up onto the side of the other piece. And then in that location, effectively what you're trying to bend is now double the thickness. And if you've ever done any bending before, you know that that thickness is so, so critical. There's such a narrow threshold of appropriate thickness for bending. And if you go above that even a little bit, it's gonna break. And so by doubling it, it's for sure going to break. Um, if Again, if you have the two pieces accidentally overlap a little bit. Now I'm just gonna put a little piece of tape on each end. Let's go ahead and flip that over. So the tape just holds my orientation so we don't lose it. So I'll hold my template there, mark the end of the upper bout, mark the waist, which is the most important part for the purpose of bending, and mark the lower bout. Then I can just take a square. And there we have it, this is ready to be thrown into a side bending sandwich and thrown on the side bending machine. Lots of throwing here. Actually, uh, no, we don't want to be that careless. We won't throw anything. So here it is. All right, let's set up our bending sandwich. Now I often reuse the foil and parchment paper, aluminum foil and par parchment paper that I used for previous bends, especially for bending these binding strips, just because the binding strips bend a lot easier than the sides do. So it really don't have to be, I can afford to be a little bit sloppy with um, how I wrap them. Just gonna place this right in there. And there's a mark on the paper here that I can see, it's kind of faint, but that is where I put the waste. Okay, and that's just for the purpose of then when I place it in the side bending machine, I will be able to know where the waste actually is inside here so that I can orient this with the waist of the actual side bending form. Before we close this up, we got to just open this up very simple and just give that a little spritz. Not a bad idea to spritz it on both sides. So we've got our outer piece of spring steel. We've got our 
foil parchment paper and the ebony strips. And now we have our heating blanket and the other outer piece of spring steel. And that gives us our sandwich, okay? I like to think of it as the two pieces of spring steel are like the bread, the wood is the meat, and heating blanket, that's our cheese. All right, one job down. Let's jump right to the next thing that I talked about that we're gonna be doing, which is drilling our tuner holes. In order to drill our holes, we need to know what tuners we're using so that we know what size drill bit we're gonna be using. Now, I'm actually using a different set of tuners for each of these guitars. In fact, they're really a completely different conception of what a tuner is. So this is a much more standard looking tuner. This is the Goto 510 Minis. These are awesome tuners. I've been using them for the longest time. A lot of independent solo luthiers such as myself, I, I just noticed, happen to use these Goto 510 Minis. They're very popular in the boutique community. And um, what I like about them is that they're eight, 1 to 18 gear ratio. So 18 turns of the knob, gives you one turn of the tuner post. You get lots of precision there. And uh, I really like them in this super cool, shiny Cosmo black color. I think it works with everything else that's going on on this instrument. On this guitar, we're gonna be using, this is the all Wangi guitar. You can see this head plate here is Wangi. We're gonna be using Steinberger gearless tuners. So this, is I've talked about these a lot in different videos, so I'm, I'm not gonna go too crazy here, but this is a completely different conception of how a tuner should work. In this case, the tuner, instead of the string wrapping around the post like it does on a normal tuner, this actually pulls the string down inside of a, basically a little cavity inside of the headstock, okay? And because it's gearless, it has more precision than this one, Essentially, this would be the equivalent of a 40 to 1 ratio, okay? So, that's that. This tuner here, the Goto 510 Minis, requires a 3 8 of an inch hole, and actually it requires a slightly bigger than 3 8 of an inch hole at a taper. And so we use 3 8 of an inch knowing that we are going to later on ream the last little bit to fit the appropriate taper of the tuner uh, bushing. I don't know if bushing is the right word for that portion of the tuner, but we'll go with that. Order of operations is drill your hole, and then much later on, we will fit the tuners by actually tapering that hole. With the Steinbergers, it's just a straight hole, and it's a 10 millimeter hole, so we're gonna use a 10 millimeter bit. All right, let's drill. First, we'll do the 3 8 of an inch. The Rosewood guitar, which has the, the Goto 510 Minis. Tighten that up, and you can actually turn the chuck and go to a second hole. So you, you do your first tightening here, and you can actually get a little bit more by then going, turning this and giving it a little second turn there. And that gets it nice and tight. Got a nice piece of scrap wood for underneath, and this piece of scrap wood doesn't have too many holes or damage on it, which is good. Because what, what I want to do is find a nice, fresh, untouched piece of scrap wood for every hole that I drill. I'm, I'm going to keep moving this. Because if I keep drilling in the same place, what happens is that first time that I drill through into the board, I create a concavity below where I'm drilling. And then on every subsequent hole, it's actually going to tear out a little bit more and more because there's nothing actually backing up that breakout surface anymore. And you can always pump the drill bit a little bit. 
and that allows it to eject the material. All right, so now I've repositioned to a new blank spot on the backer board here. And again, if I wiggle this a little bit, I can actually feel the brad point finding its proper location. Lock that down. And on we go. All right, and there we have it. We've got tuner holes. Drilling my fret marker dot holes, which will be filled with mother of pearl, and also installing the mother of pearl side dots. Now this Wengi board is already complete, but I'm gonna show you this whole process, how I got to this point on my other fretboard, my ebony fretboard, Macassar Ebony, which I'll be using on guitar number 87. Okay, that's the other parlor guitar. All right, so let's jump right into that. I can just use the fretboard I just did, this Wengi one. So I'll just hold this up right here, and I'm just gonna make little marks here to remind myself which fret spaces I'm doing. I'm doing the 5, the 7, the 9, and the 12. It's important to note that some people do the third fret here, some people don't. I am not doing it. Some people do the 15 and the 17. In fact, a, a lot of instrument makers do the 15 and the 17. I am not doing those either. I like a kind of sparse looking face of the fretboard. Now if that bothers you, as, as a musician, for the purposes of locating where you are on the fretboard. If that bothers you, keep in mind that I do have those locations, the third, the 15, and the 17 on my side dots. I always think of it as the face dots are for the audience, but the side dots are definitely for the player. So I will leave the face dots kind of sparse and really fill out the side dots. All right, we need to find the center for where we're gonna drill those dots. And we can do that by just marking X's in the fret space. And the center of the X is the center of that fret space. So I'm just going to visibly offset that by about that pencil diameter. Make my mark. Then go to the other two edges here. Line it up. Offset it by the thickness of the pencil. And trace my mark. Okay. Center of that X there, that's our mark. There's two dots at the seventh fret and two at the 12. So how do I get those, right? We know how to get the center of uh, just a single dot space. So to get the double dot, what I like to do is just skip the seven for now, and we're gonna jump over to the nine. We're gonna mark out our X there. And then once we have the nine, we can take a straight edge and line it up with our two centers at the five and the nine, draw a straight line. That straight line will then split these boxes in half and then we can just do the same thing in uh, the now two boxes, right? Well, let's do it for real. So I'll jump to the nine, offset by the thickness of the pencil, make a line, go to the other corners, and make another line. Okay, got my two X's. And now let's connect the line between those two X's. Okay. 
Okay, that looks pretty good. Giving it the eyeball test. And the eyeball test, by the way, is just kind of step back and eyeball it and either it looks good or it doesn't to your eye. Sometimes you can pick out some really egregious errors by just taking a step back and looking at it. All right, so now I'm gonna do the seven here. And the 12. Okay, once again, give that the eyeball test. All right, that looks pretty good. Now I'm gonna use an awl to punch out these locations, which will help the brad point on our Forstner bit find that center mark very easily. All right, and there you have it. So we're not going to actually install the mother of pearl into these holes right now for reasons that uh, aren't all that interesting and we're not really gonna get into. What I do at this point do is install the side dots like you see here. So those, I, I not only drill the holes, but we're also going to add the mother of pearl. And by the way, we're using mother of pearl for the side dots. We're not using that crappy plastic dot rod stock uh, that you see on on so many guitars. I never really understand why anyone, even, even uh, companies that have to be more economical, I still don't understand why they use that stuff. It's not like these tiny little mother of pearl dots are expensive. Uh, I see a lot of amateur builders still using that plastic crap and you're you're saving you know maybe a, a couple bucks at, at the most use mother of pearl it looks better please so once again we want to make sure we get our side dots in the right place so i'll just use the first board that i did in order to mark out all the fret spaces and i'm doing a double dot at the 12. Mark out all the fret spaces ahead of time so I don't screw that up. And now I always have a marking gauge that is permanently set up for my side dots. And so I can just take this marking gauge and rest it on the bottom surface and just mark that out. All right, so now I'm just gonna go to each fret space that I've marked and I'm gonna use this center finding ruler here to mark uh, the center between the two fret slots, okay? So we'll start with the third fret, line that up. Actually, this is easier if you do it upside down. So line up the third fret. Okay, there's my mark. I like to take a little baby square here and square that mark. So now where this mark meets the marking gauge score line that we made, the center of that X, that's exactly where we're gonna put our dot. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and mark out the rest of these. Okay, let's load this up into our vise here. Before I do this, it's a good idea to just take your fretboard and play a little air guitar with it. The reason for that is just to make damn sure that the location that you're about to drill your holes are facing up, right? 
towards you, it'd really be a shame to accidentally mark and drill your holes on the wrong side. Okay? All right, so we, that's definitely, those holes are gonna be on the correct side of the fretboard. And the first thing we're gonna do is punch those out with the awl, just like we did before. Now what makes this a little bit easier in this case is the fact that for one of those axes of our X, we used a scoring tool, which means we can actually take this awl and you can actually feel when you're in that score, which means that's very easy to be, uh, be sure that you're in the correct spot within one axis, right? and then you just have to line yourself up on the other axis. So here I can feel that little all mark there. I'm gonna bring that up and press. Okay, I've got my drill. I'm gonna place that and give it a little wiggle. I can put my fingers on it and give that drill bit a little bit of a wiggle just to confirm that I'm actually in the center punch mark. Another way to confirm it too is I can run this in reverse just for a second like that. And if the drill bit happens to be up on the sidewall of that dished out center punch mark, if it's kind of up on the sidewall of it, when you run it in reverse, it'll actually fall into the center, centering itself, okay? And then you just switch back to forward motion and drill. Depth isn't all that important. You just wanna make sure you're deep enough to get this tiny little dot embedded in there. And then I'll take my dot and very carefully place it on there without dropping it. Okay, that went in. And it's always handy to keep a little piece of scrap wood nearby. I like to find something hard like ebony for this. And it's just so that I can take this, put a little corner of the wood on there and then give it a little tap. I only need to do that if I have like an end of the pearl sticking up at an angle. If it goes in nice and easy, uh, you don't need to use this. And I just add the tiniest dot of water thin super glue. All right, so that's it. I'm gonna do all the other ones. By the way, if you're fumbling with the dot, I'm just gonna show you something cool. So you saw me pick up this little dot and then carefully place it on there. If you are fumbling with it, you can take just a piece of clear tape. This is packaging tape. Could be scotch tape though, doesn't really matter. And you can place your dot on that clear tape. And it is a lot easier to line up this dot with your hole just by holding onto the piece of tape like this. Anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and knock out the rest of these dots. What I'm gonna show you today is how to get some really sweet looking miters at the various points where your binding scheme comes together. So this is a bit of an advanced tip here and I'm gonna try not to get lost in the weeds of how to cut binding channels and everything like that. Cause some of you guys may already be somewhat familiar with that concept and really what I'm trying to do is build upon the idea of binding and cutting binding channels and installing the binding by showing you how luthiers get that really cool framed look of the body where the, in this case, the white lines of the maple purfling seem to meet at a corner and then turn. How do we get those various miters? This one's all prepared, so I'm gonna show you a bit of what I'm talking about. And then after this, I'm gonna actually 
show you how to execute this because I have a whole nother guitar body that I'm doing this to. Uh, I have to go cut the binding channels for it and uh, do all the other work to get to this point. So you'll see that in just a moment. But let me see if I can hold all this together just to show you. All right, so that's probably the best I can do holding it together. Obviously, I need to glue this later on, and that is what we're after here. There's a lot of ways to do this, to do your the meeting points between your end wedge and the binding. And what a lot of people do for simplicity is you can just run your purfling right over it like that. And that can look really good too, but I think there's something a little bit extra slick looking and sophisticated with your binding setup if you can manage and again it's a bit more work a bit more advanced but if you can manage to have all your purfling uh, be mitered and turn at those points all right so let's put this guitar number 87 on its shelf here and I'm going to go ahead and start cutting the binding channels for the Wengi guitar, guitar number 86, the other parlor guitar. All right, so we're going to cut the back binding channels first. I'm going to do the top binding channels too, which they're going to have their own issues with connecting the purfling scheme, which is going to be this cool dyed blue poplar and maple strips that I have on the rosette. Same kind of thing for the purfling. All right, but we're over here. I've got my carrier. I actually had to make, because this is such a small body size, I had to make a whole special dedicated binding carrier just for my parlor guitars. That's what happens when you make a size instrument that is so far, for, far removed from the typical OM, Dreadnought, Jumbo kind of sizes that are common in our culture. Okay, nope, I'm doing this backwards, hold on. So we need to load up the carrier on this side here so that we can then flip it over and cut the back binding channels. So the key insight that I can give as to how to do this is that it matters greatly the order of operations that you do things when you want those purfling lines to meet up and wrap and create that framing effect. So I'll tell you what the order that I'm going to do is right now. And it is different, you know, everyone, I've, I've arrived at this order through ex experimentation over time. That's not to say that other builders haven't arrived at the same exact conclusion, they probably have, but also other builders uh, may do this in a slightly different order. It's really all about just sitting down and thinking uh, about thinking ahead, right? Thinking what's going to happen once I make this cut, what does that allow me to do later? So with that said, what I'm going to do is route the binding channel all the way around on the back and route the purfling channel which is just a tiny narrow ledge for holding that maple strip. As you'll see, there's a, a little area here that I stopped short of with the binding tower jig to leave a little bit of wood there. And that's really the key part of this whole thing. So stick around to the end to see what I do with the hand tools in this section. Then I'm going to route the pocket for my end wedge, install the end wedge and sand that back. And we're gonna come in with hand tools and very carefully work that area. And I'm a little bit nervous about how this Wengi is going to react to the cutter on the binding towers. And so I'm going to just wipe some true oil on the surface here, which is going to at least partially seal that grain, which can mitigate um, the sort of splintering and the tear out that you might get. 
I'm sure I'll still get the fuzzy edges that stand up at the edges of the binding channel. That's not a problem. I just always pull those up before I glue the binding in. What I really don't want to get is tear out. The Wangi is a very splintery material, I find. So it's prudent to do this. All right, you might wonder why I got the middle of the top, the back and not just right at the edges. That's simply because I know I'll be installing the binding with tape and that tape has a tendency to pull up little itty bitty fibers. Not a big deal, but since I can help that a little bit with the true oil, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. First, I'm gonna set the height so that the back is level here in preparation for binding. I need this surface to be level. And I'm going to do that with my fancy ruler here, which is just a stick, a piece of scrap wood with a single mark on it. Because it doesn't matter exactly what height I set this to, just that I set it to the same height at all four corners. good. You ever get that tipping? It's actually really difficult to get an object to rest on four points simultaneously. It's very easy to get it to rest on three points. Think for example of a regular table with four legs or a one of those little corner tables that just has three legs. Um, the four leg table is much more likely to tip on in one place. So the trick to getting rid of that little tipping that we hear there is to figure out which orientation, either like this or like this, which orientation is more true. So I put my finger here to hold it down um, in the orientation that rests on this pillar here. And I check that. Now while still holding that side down, I'm going to check this. And that looks pretty good. Now if I do the opposite, hold that down. This looks low now. So this orientation resting on here I don't like. That's our true orientation. So now I'm essentially resting on these three points and I'm perfectly level, okay? This fourth point right here, I'm just going to loosen this and lift it up until it meets the body and then we're good, we've got no more tipping. Loosen that and push it up just a hair until it meets body. And there it is. And I can, you know, recheck that again just to be sure, but there's no reason why that shouldn't now be perfectly level and with no tipping. So that is just a really cool tip for you guys that, I mean, I remember when I first figured that out and I had probably made a dozen guitars before then, more than a dozen. And, and so I'm not going to carry you through the whole process of cutting these ch channels again because this isn't a video about simply cutting binding channels. It's about getting those miters. But maybe we'll, well, I'll end it there. So here's another little tip for you guys. I'm getting ready to do the secondary channel on here for the thin little maple purfling strip. And as you can see on my bearing here, well, let me first start by saying, as many of you guys may be aware of if you're familiar with using a binding tower to cut binding channels, 
it works by uh, having a set of bearings of various sizes and the smaller the bearing that you put on here means the larger the thickness of the or the depth you might say of the channel that you're cutting okay sometimes though you end up wanting a channel depth that is between two of the sizes that you have meaning with one bearing the channel's too big and with the other bearing the channel's too small so you want that goldilocks bearing that exists right in the middle and you can get that by simply putting tape a single strip of tape around the bearing well there you go that gives me the in-between size that i needed all right so i'm going to cut the purfling channels now all right let's do it Okay, it's really hard to see what I'm about to show you here just because of the lighting and because of the little fuzzy edges standing up at the edge of the channel, kind of conceal what I'm talking about. But I'll just tell you what I have here. So it's very important for this process to get these perfect miters that on the purfling ledge, I stop just short of the backstripe here because I want to actually leave a little bit of material there, which I'm going to then much later, I'm going to score that material and remove it with a chisel. And then with that same chisel, cut those miters right into the, either the fiber strip or in this case, the maple that I have here. So what I'm essentially what I'm doing is I'm cutting the entire purfling channel and leaving just the tiniest bit here so that I can come back later with my hand tools to mate that up perfectly. But for now, I'm moving on to the binding and purfling channels of the soundboard side before we do the end wedge. Okay, got my body held in the radius vise that I have here. The radius on the vise is, simply ensures that it's only ever pinching down on the outside edges, the rims of the guitar. Whereas if these vise jaws were flat, I would for sure be putting pressure on the center of the back plate and the top and very easily would be collapsing and splitting the back and the top, and that's not good. So um, this is something I made, by the way. You can just cut a radius into two two by fours and make a vise out of it. So this is all for the purpose of cutting the end wedge now. And I've got my special vise here, which is actually a part of the neck angle jig that I use by a company called Luthery Tool, or Luthier Tool. And you can see I've made a special template for the shape and taper of end wedge that I want to have. And, but first, before I use this template, I have to use this alignment template to get this lined up on center. By the way, I used to, before I started using this, I used this just for the speed and efficiency of it, but I used to cut my end wedges by hand and install them that way. That's the way I show it in the online course if you're a part of the online guitar building school. That's the way I teach it there because most people aren't gonna have uh, some of the you know, fancier equipment that I have here. But nowadays, just so you know, I'm doing it with a router. It's quicker, a router and a template. That method works. So I've got this lined up. The alignment template pops right out. And the end wedge template goes into place. Now I can take the router. 
and set my depth. The depth is very important here because I need to set the depth so that it's slightly less than my binding channels. Or at the very most, it's exactly the depth of my binding channels. But better to err on the side of slightly less because we don't want the pocket that we're cutting to show up um, beyond the depth of the binding channel on the back plate surface or on the top surface. Okay? So bottom that out on the guitar. And I've got a little template here. Or not template, just a, a dummy stick here for quickly and easily setting the depth that I want, which is very shallow. There we go. Okay, and that's it. Very simple process for cutting end wedge pockets. And this is my end wedge right here, just a piece of ebony. So I've got my ebony wedge and I also have my maple purfling strip material. And so I'll just break this off to about the size I need, plus a little bit more. And just wedge those in there as well. Okay, and now before I glue this in, I'm just going to mark... Um, this end wedge is very tall right now, so I'm going to mark where I want to cut it down before I glue it in. Cut that on the bandsaw and then we're good to go. Okay, give that a final look before it gets glued in. Looks good. It's a super simple glue up here. I'll just pop these out run some glue in the pocket. And I like to be a little excessive with the glue in this case. The extra glue squeeze out doesn't cause any problems in this situation here. And I like to take the end wedge itself and I'm just gonna use the sides of this to move this around and push it, push the glue up against the edges. Also at the same time, that's getting the edges of this um, it's getting glue on the edges of the end wedge, which is good because we need glue not only up into these corners, but also we want there to be glue between these strips and the ebony piece. So that easily gets glue everywhere in all the appropriate places. Okay, press that down. So love doing inlays with tapered wedges like this because all you have to do is pull and wedge it into place and it will take up any little micro gaps. I'm just gonna get some of that heavy glue out of there before I then put my weight on top. And there it is. So we'll leave that alone. I did get a little a uh, piece of tear out, I'm not sure if you guys saw it there in the camera, at the top of my, uh, where the end wedge meets the top of the binding channel. And that's just something that I'm gonna have to deal with a little bit later, which is cool because I'm actually gonna show you how easy it is to hide little things like that on dark woods like wangi, like rosewood, like ebony. But we'll save that for later. Now we get into the real meat and potatoes here of our purfling miter work. I'm breaking out the grommel, that's G-R-A-M-I-L, grommel. And this is a special tool, I believe LMI sells it, which you can not only use to cut your entire binding channels and purfling channels, but I like to use it here just to score and remove the remaining material next to and around the end wedge and the back stripe in order to prep those miters. 
First things first, we are going to remove the excess height of the end wedge. And the way I do that is by breaking off a small piece of the side purfling material that I'm using. And I'm going to rest that on the binding channel and set up my grommel so that the scoring bit rests right on that side purfling strip. Because when all is said and done, the maple purfling is going to meet the other maple purfling at the end wedge and stop there, but the ebony binding strip is going to continue. So that's why we need to set the height of the end wedge to just above that purfling line. And now I just repeatedly score the ebony until all the material above that purfling line is removed. It takes a good bit of scoring because, well, the ebony is quite dense. Next, I'm dry fitting the first binding strip and purfling strip on the soundboard side. This is for the purpose of marking a few things out at that meeting point between the two binding strips and the end wedge. I want to mark where the soundboard purfling meets the center line of the top. I also want to mark where the binding strip meets that center line because both of these are going to form a butt joint with the other adjacent piece of purfling and binding. Now the final thing I need to mark here is where the side purfling meets the end wedge purfling strip. And this is very important because that's where I'm going to cut my miter. At the other end, far less care is taken for accuracy because the end point of the purfling and the binding in this location is going to be completely covered by the fretboard tongue. In fact, I always leave this about a quarter inch off of center. Now I use a small miter box to cut the binding strips. This ensures a nice clean and square cut at both of those locations. My bent purfling strip sandwich can also be cut in the same way here because I will be using that to form a butt joint at the end wedge. The only thing left to cut after the soundboard purfling is the side purfling and that is where I'm going to carefully cut my miter. Here I use an eighth of an inch chisel to trim back the excess side purfling and leave just a little angled bevel at the end of the remaining purfling and of course that is our miter. There's no need to get quote unquote the perfect angle here. You can just eyeball what you think will work in this case because the purfling strip is so narrow. If I was doing something uh, quite a bit wider than this, like say trying to cut a miter into the full height of the binding strip, that would be much more difficult. But when you're dealing with very thin elements like this, you can just eyeball that angle. And now I take that same chisel and just nip a corresponding angle into the purfling coming up off of the side of the end wedge. And now before we glue this, we want to just check and make sure that that angle looks good because we can always take another little nip off of there to adjust that angle just slightly if we want to clean it up. And it looks good, so now I'm going to glue the binding and the purfling strip all at once using Tight Bond Original and just running the glue out a little bit at a time and using good strong binding tape, such as the stuff you can find at StuMac. Okay, so the top is all taped up and done, and I'll be able to remove that tape and check that out tomorrow, which will be really cool to see how all that blue turned out. 
By the way, I like to do the top first for a very important reason because before I install the binding and the purfling, those ledges that are cut into the soundboard are extremely fragile. We're kind of in the most delicate state that the instrument is in during the whole process when I have those channels cut because the slightest thing can damage those channels irrecoverably. We have those nice crisp edges of the channels, which if you accidentally dig a fingernail into it or you just have it flat on the, the bench and a little piece of scrap wood is sitting right at that edge, it will imprint on that edge and even tear out some wood and, or, or even just kind of round over the crispness of the edge, which will make it so that no matter what you do, gluing that in, you're going to have a little bit of a gap there. So, glad to, always glad to have that sealed up just because the channel edge is now safe. These channels I don't worry about nearly as much because it's a hardwood instead of a softwood. So, I do these second. Otherwise, when I have this face down, I am uh, pretty likely to screw up one of those channels. All right, so we are here on this part of the end wedge now. now. Now, this is the most interesting part because we not only have the end wedge that we want to marry up with the side purfling, but at the same time, we have to marry up the back stripe with the purfling on the perimeter of the back, okay? So this is going to be really the same as what we did on the top side where I'm gonna take this, I can place uh, my little scrap wherever that ended up, my little scrap of this material of the maple. I'm gonna place my scrap on that ledge, then I can set my grommel mill up based off of that scrap on the ledge. That will allow me to clear off the excess end wedge on the top here. And then I'm gonna do a similar thing right here. It might be hard to tell on the camera, but you can see I left a little bit of extra wood at the end of this purfling channel. So this purfling ledge here just kinda peters out before it hits the back stripe. And that gives me the opportunity to set the grommel up to match that tiny ledge and then use the grommel to score out that last little bit of material and remove it by hand and then take a chisel and just put a tiny little angle on those two pieces of maple. It's a lot of work for what some might say is a small return, but when you do it right and you can admire those connections, I think it's a pretty big return on your investment there, your investment in time. And you can also see right here, I think I mentioned this earlier, that I did have a little mishap uh, when I was routing this pocket for the end wedge and a little chunk of Wengi broke off right here at the edge. Normally when I do that routing, I always come straight down from the top but in this case, I thought I did that here, but I must have left a little piece there. And so when I was exiting with the router out this way, it caught on that edge and just teared off a chunk. Just so you know, what I'm gonna do to fix that is when I glue all this in, when I glue the strips in, I'm gonna make sure that I leave a little dry spot with no glue right where that uh, impression is because I don't want that impression to fill in with tight bond. That is not the proper fill for what we're trying to do. It would look bad if dried glue got in there. So I'm gonna leave a little dry area near here, I, also considering that glue squeezes out. So I wanna leave a little extra space uh, thinking ahead like that. And then I'm, after everything's installed, that will create a nice little, the binding will create sort of a barrier so that anything that I fill this with which will just be simply uh, a small piece of Wengi to match and some black super glue to fill in around the edges of that small piece of Wengi. So that's how I'm gonna do that. 
But let's get back to what I'm doing here. I think I explained that pretty sufficiently what I'm gonna do, and now you can watch me do it. All right, so both ends are ready to go now. So I can dry fit my binding strip and exactly like I did for the top, I'm going to mark exactly where it meets these elements and trim this down and then trim that little piece of maple purfling down, uh, putting that little miter on it again, exactly like I did for the top. So you probably won't get to see that again here. And then the purfling that's going to go on the back plate and mate up with the back stripe in the middle is just this very thin piece of maple here, strip of maple. And this, quite simply, I'm just going to take to my sanding board, just like that, and just gently put a little angle into it. And that looks pretty good. So the thing about these angles, you might see me doing this and think, well, he's just doing that by eye. For something this thin, you can get away with uh, not having a perfect angle. Uh, you, it, when it's all said and done, it gets kind of squished in there, and you actually can't tell at all if the angle's off. Whereas if it was a bigger piece, like, you know, these big binding strips are, you would absolutely be able to tell if the two angles didn't join together just right. Um, either way though, before I start with the glue, I'm gonna stick this in there and just see if it looks satisfactory. All right, no sense in showing you the glue up again. So here we are after the glue has cured and I am using my wonderful little 25 millimeter finger plane to take back all that binding and purfling down to the surface of the sides and the surface of the top and back so that we can ultimately sand this thing and see what it looks like. And good morning everyone. So I've sanded this back and as promised I'm going to show you that little fill that I needed to do. I've already shaped a small piece of wangi and you can see it's sitting right there in its place. So I'm going to, in this case, I'm going to glue it back with tight bond. I could use the black super glue, but I know that that would definitely stain the maple right uh, along the border there. And I don't want to do that. So I'm going to use good old tight bond. And that's that. I'll show you this when it's done. Thank you. 
Okay, we'll give that a minute, and then I'll trim it back. All right, and here it is, guys. It's looking pretty good. So you can see that is what we were after all along. Um, especially this meeting point here between the end wedge, the back stripe, and the two halves of the binding purfling scheme. That is a particularly attractive looking juncture when you get it right. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.